Okay. Uh, Tom spoke about housing and mortgages, while Chris spoke about <coughs> the bank. So I'll try to speak about the economy and what's going to happen with the economy uh, looking ahead. Uh, we've had the most severe recession and financial crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, given the monetary and the fiscal stimulus and the backstopping of the financial system, now we're close to the bottom, at least on a temporary basis. And now the debate is, of course, on what's going to happen, uh, the shape of the recovery. Given what has happened in the markets, I would say the markets are pricing now a V-shaped recovery with rapid return uh, to potential growth, and that's even what the macro forecaster consensus is. Uh, there is a second view that is the one I share, is that this recovery is going to be at best anemic, subpar, below trend. We've grown well below trend for the next couple of years, not just in the U.S., but also in advanced economies, so more like a U-shaped recovery. That's also the view of the IMF and the one of those folks at PIMCO who are talking about the new normal. But there is also a third view, uh, the view that actually we might have a kind of like a double dip, a W-shape kind of recession. And when I speak about that idea with people like George Soros, he says, if it's going to be a double dip, it's going to be an inverted square root, meaning we go up, we go down, and then we go back to an L, essentially, because we're going to run out of policy bullets if there is a second dip. So, so what's going to be uh, the outlook, uh, V, U, W? I sign about the 60% probability to the U, about 25 or so to a W and less than 20 to a V. I think that the chances of a rapid recovery to, of growth are, are very, very slim. Uh, why? First observation about this is the labor market. The unemployment rate is almost 10%. If you include unemployed, uh, discouraged workers and partial employed is already 17%. It's true we are not losing 700,000 jobs a month like in January. It's only 260. But during the last recession, it was only 150. And the last recession was mild, only eight months. And we had job losses continuing after the recession was over in November 2001, all the way through August of 2003. Job loss and then jobless recovery. This time around, it's going to be just the same, only worse. The ratio between applicants to vacancies is 6 to 1. The ratio of continuing to initial claims is as high as ever. The average duration of unemployment is as high as ever. And the point is that the losses uh, of labor income are not deriving only from the job losses, because as you know, labor income is the product of jobs times hours times average hourly wages. And now as a way of sharing the pain, many firms tell their worker, let's cut hours, let's uh, accept furloughs, and also let's accept uh, lower average wages. The full-time equivalent of the loss of hours in the United States is another 3 million full-time jobs lost on top of the 7.2 7.2 million that were lost formally. So the effects on labor income have been massive. And with collapsing labor income, how are you going to have a recovery of consumption? Second observation, this is not your typical kind of recession because inflation gets out of hand, the Fed puts a break, and then you go in a recession, and then you take the break away, and you have a rapid recovery. It's V-shaped. This, we agree, is a kind of a recession driven by over leverage and debt accumulation, a balance sheet recession debt accumulation of the household sector, of the financial system, and also of a fat tail of the corporate sector. And while there is a lot of talk about deleveraging, when you look at those debt ratios of the private sector, they're not rising any further. They've stabilized at very high level, and they're barely falling. And instead, there's a way of socializing the private losses. We have now had a massive releveraging of the public sector with huge budget deficit and debt accumulation. Net U.S. debt as a share of GDP is going to double from 40 to 80. Officially, we are estimating a cumulative $9 trillion deficit over the next decade. Now, if you take this interpretation of the crisis as being a debt crisis, there are at least another five reasons, in my view, in addition to the weakness of the labor market, while it's going to be, at best, an anemic recovery and, at worst, a, a double dip. First one, uh, the U.S. consumer, and it's not just the U.S. consumer, it's also the consumer in all the country that had large current account deficit and housing bubbles, is U.K., is Ireland, is Iceland, is Spain, is the Baltic state, is Dubai, is Australia, New Zealand. So this consumer is shopped out, saving less debt burden. And even when GDP growth is going to become positive, consumption growth has to be smaller than GDP growth as a way of rebuilding savings and reducing the leverage ratio. But since consumption is 70% of GDP, then if consumption grows less than GDP, then GDP growth has to be very weak. 
unless other components of aggregate demand are growing much faster. And I'll argue they're not going to go much faster. So that's the first and crucial point. The U.S. consumer has never been squeezed so much, both in terms of his P&L and balance sheet. Savings rate have gone now from zero to four. IMF estimates have to go to 8%. So there'll be significant further slowdown in consumption. Second point. Um, in the typical V-shaped recovery, investment, capex spending, grows much faster than GDP. That's why you have a V-shaped recovery. But this time around, I don't think there's going to be any robust growth in capex spending, leaving aside even housing that is in the doldrum. And the reason is very simple. Capacity utilization in the United States today is 70%. Capacity utilization in the Eurozone is 70%. It's the lowest we've had in decades in any recession. Capacity has to be at least 80-85% before you see any pickup in investment. The point is, if a third of capacity is not utilized, why would anybody want to do more capex spending? There's a glut of capacity. You're not using a third of it. So why would you want to do capex? There's not going to be any significant recovery of capex spending. Third point, the damage to financial system and to credit growth. It's not just the damage, of course, to the traditional banks. You know, the big ones have been backstop, but we have hundreds of them that have been closed by the FDIC, and those that are on the critical list is another 479 so far. Most likely it's going to increase. So it's not just the small banks and medium-sized banks that are in trouble, but more crucially, most of the shadow banking system, the non-bank financial institutions, has been either destroyed or severely damaged. 350 non-bank mortgage lenders, gone. Sieves and conduits, gone. Securitization, as Tom was saying, died two years ago, and there's none of it in the private sector. Hedge funds had to deleverage. Private equity funds had the trouble with LBOs which had never occurred. AIG, Fannie and Freddie, Citi, Bear Stearns, Lehman, finance companies, massive amount of distress in the shadow banking system. The point being, today, credit growth in the financial system is negative, and as Chris was pointing out there is not even credit growth through the corporate system. But even if and when credit growth is going to become positive, credit growth is not going to be as robust as the go go years, in which we had the high growth of the economy because of a credit bubble and a credit boom. And if you don't have any credit growth, how are you going to finance capex spending? How are you going to finance residential investment? How are you going to finance construction of new homes? How are you going to finance consumption of durable goods? So with low credit growth, we're going to have slower growth of the economy. Fourth point about the fiscal stimulus. The fiscal stimulus in the US and other countries by the middle of next year becomes a fiscal drag. And if there is not any meaningful recovery of private demand and argue why there's not going to be a recovery of private demand, then you'll have a problem with growth again slowing down sharply. And if instead we decide to increase that fiscal stimulus, again, with another fiscal package or a series of other ones, and we keep on monetizing them, eventually that's going to crowd out the recovery. Monetization of large fiscal deficit through a number of channels are going to be crowding out uh, the recovery. Final point about the EU from a global point of view. Uh, for the last decade, the U.S. and a bunch of deficit countries were the consumer of first and last resort, spending more than their income running current account deficits, and uh, in, on the other side, you had China, Germany, Japan, emerging Asia, Latin America, were producer of first and last resort, spending less than their income running current account surpluses. Now, the overspending countries have to retrench private domestic spending because they have to save more and they have to deleverage. And that's what's happened, not just the U.S., but in all those overspending countries. But if the overspenders now spend less and their trade deficits are shrinking, and therefore the surplus of the surplus country are also shrinking, then unless the over-saving countries compensate for the reduction in spending of the overspender by reducing their own savings rate and increasing their own domestic private spending, then globally, where you have a glut of capacity, and that glut of capacity is becoming bigger because now China is doing another round of capital intensive overcapacity investment. So you have a glut of capacity globally, and the recovery of global aggregate demand is going to be slower than otherwise. And therefore, you're going to have essentially an anemic recovery of the global economy. 